Okay, uh, make sure that's on. Um, my name's Amber McReynolds. I'm the Director of Elections for the City and County of Denver in beautiful Colorado. Uh, Denver's known as the Mile High City, if you didn't know that. We've got a, a beautiful picture of it up here. Um, but I wanted to, well, first off, Matt did a great presentation. I just want to make sure um, I noted that because I think it was pretty, pretty amazing and very customer focused, which you'll see that um, I'm going to talk quite a bit about customer experience today. Um, but I want to start with a, a pretty simple question uh, relative to elections, but also just relative to our everyday lives. And that is, what do you do with an idea? Especially an idea that might be different or daring or maybe a little wild or even weird. What do you do with that idea? Do you sort of set it off to the side and say, hey, that's not going to work. We know that's not going to work. We've always done it this way. We shouldn't look at that. Or are you going to consider it and nourish it and develop it and promote it even um, or look at it further? And the importance of, of creation of new ideas or anything that we do in elections or in our everyday lives is that there's a powerful tool that can help us to define it, develop it, promote it, and eventually on the back end measure it. And that is data. And that's the power of data behind uh, creating a new idea or looking at something in a different way. And my first experience in life with learning how to look at things differently was when I was about four years old. And my dad and my, I had a sister who was three. And my dad would constantly stand on his head or walk on his hands. And we thought it was the funniest thing ever. He would tip over. And we, we would find that extremely funny and laugh. And this went on and on for a few months. And I finally said, um, Dad, why do you keep doing that? It's so funny, but why do you keep doing that? And he said, well, don't you want to learn how to see things differently? And I said, well, yeah. So then I started standing on my head and, <laughs> and walking on my hands. And we all sort of learned to do this. And I, and I think it's an important story because it, at, a, at a young age, at four, he taught me how to see things differently simply by standing on my head. Um, and so we've done that in Denver. And we've done a couple of different things relating to sort of customers. And our vision has primarily focused on using data and metrics to improve the customer's experience. In our case, the voters also could be candidates, campaigns, academics, other election offices, researchers. Really, anybody could potentially be our customer. And we have created a value stream that the central core concept is the, the idea of customer. And then we've created various values that have come off of that uh, in terms of everything that we've done to improve the voter's experience or the customer's experience. And this depicts sort of a listing of some of those values, um, which, which we find to be important when we're developing new technology and new ideas. So with this sort of very customer-centric vision, uh, what have we done in Denver to advance this theory around customer experience? And at the core of everything we've done, the customer is number one. And Matt, I think, talked about this at length in the, in the last presentation. But it is key, and it isn't something that's always been done in election administration. Usually, we sort of focus on what is the law first, what are the rules, um, and how do we sort of go about our daily business. But when you actually look at sort of the customer experience and how the voters interact with your office, you can make the most measurable differences in, in their experience. And there's a couple different areas where we've, we've done things to sort of move the mark, if you will, um, and make improvements in election administration. One of those areas is operational innovation. And in particular, um, I wanted to bring up a couple of slides. And I'm going to show a, a few different examples of how we've used data to sort of implement change within our office. This shows the number of hotline calls. So this is our voter hotline. And we track uh, call volume, as well as very specific data and metrics associated with what voters call our office about. And the, the one thing that I want to point out on on this slide is that there's different ways of using data. There's macro data, and there's also micro data. 
and we might in the very two different concepts, two different uh, data sets. An example on this chart of macro data is just the total number of calls. So 2008, we had over 57,000 calls into our voter hotline. 2014, that went down to just over 6,100. It's great to know the total number of calls, but what does it really tell us in the context of comparing to other elections or looking specifically at why the voters are calling our office? So it's great to know the total number. I'm sure many offices know the total number of calls they got, but how much do they know within that sort of big number? How many calls were about mail ballots? How many calls were about voter registration? How many calls were about how to find a polling place or where to go vote? Uh, how many calls were about campaign finance? So if we can sort of dig down deep into the data and answer those questions, we're going to be able to make more change and move the mark in a, in a more positive way as we look at customer service. The other piece that this slide sh shows is how to present data differently. So yes, it's great that we have the total number of calls, but how is that relevant to the voter specifically or the election specifically? So I've broken it down. In 2008, that 57,000 calls meant that one in five of our voters who voted in that election had to call us and ask us something. That's a terrible, horrible result. And we looked at that and said, how do we proactively communicate information to voters in the future so that we can reduce that call volume and make it easier for voters to access information? So calls to clicks, if you will. By 2014, we moved that to one in 38 voters. And this, by, make, by presenting the metric in that way, we can actually compare similar and like elections given that sort of breakdown considering turnout. The other piece of this uh, uh, data that I've got up here today is also about first call resolution. And so one of the things, it's great to know the total number of calls, but of those total number of calls that an election office gets, how many got resolved by the very first agent that the voter talked to? A lot of us have had an experience where we call a uh, business or a bank or you know some sort of uh, uh, business to get customer service and it's very frustrating to get transferred. So in 2008 we were only at a 67 percent first call resolution meaning that over a third of our calls had to get transferred to somebody else to answer and we felt that was a very bad metric and so we've been taking steps since 2008 to move the mark on that and in our most recent general election, we were at a 98% first call resolution, meaning that only 2% of those 6,100 calls had to get answered by a different person that, than the one that picked up the phone initially. So this is tremendously powerful data, gives us an ability to make significant changes within our office, as well as improve the voters' experience overall. Another example of the way we've used data, and this is very internal to the office, um, but, it, but it does a few different things. This is the average number of ballots processed by an election day, uh, by an election judge on election day. And we've looked at that over time, and we, all of our staff is actually trained in lean principles and eliminating waste. And this is one of the baseline metrics that we've used to move the mark and get more efficient and generate cost savings. Uh, so when we look at you know, whether or not we need to implement new equipment or how we can improve a process, this is very much the metric that we look at. And you can see that we have a marketable improvement since 2010, um, which is what this graph shows. Another example of operational uh, use of data is uh, when it comes to technical implementation of equipment. So we were trying to make a decision on whether or not we wanted to procure a new piece of equipment that would sort of improve various uh, processes within our mail ballot processing area. And one of the metrics is we wanted to look at how many mail pieces per hour an election judge could process. And the equipment itself, uh, you know, based on what the vendor provided to us, we were able to make some projections and then after the fact we've we've done an analysis of how that implementation went. Prior to the equipment, uh, an election judge could do about 515, 515 mail pieces per hour. After the equipment, that went up to 2,000 mail pieces per hour. So four times better than what we were doing before. 
So those are some operational examples, and now I want to give some policy examples of where we've used data and how we've made, a, made an improvement in our process. Um, the Colorado model now has a few different components. Uh, most of you have heard you know, something about our, our new model, but essentially it's ballot delivery, and I very specifically say that. I don't call it vote by mail. Um, and the main reason why is that most voters actually return their ballot in person as opposed to using the post office to mail it back. We also have proactive list maintenance, and we have in-person voting options at voter service centers, and we also modernize the voter registration process. And one of the biggest stories out of our modernization has to do with provisional ballots. And when the legislature was considering a move to for this new model, Colorado was already performing very well amongst states in terms of turnout in the Pew election uh, performance index. Colorado was number three after the 2012 election. And we wanted to look at, you know, continually to improve sort of the performance of elections within Colorado, but specifically around the voters' experience. And when we looked at 2012, we had 65, 000, over 65,000 ballots cast in a, as a provisional statewide. And the majority of those counted. So we had a 92% a count rate of the 65,000 ballots that got cast. And what that means is those ballots all eventually ended up getting counted, but they got counted two or three weeks after the election. And they also cost about 10 times as much to process. So we looked at this metric and we said there's no reason for us to be ha having all these provisionals cast. What can we do from a policy perspective to improve that metric? And so when we got our new modernized Colorado election model, the result of that for the 2014 general election was less than 1,000 provisionals cast statewide. So we went from 2.5% uh, percentage percentage. Uh, of our ballots being provisional to 0.04% in the last general election. This is a huge cost savings, and I can't emphasize that enough. This is probably one of the biggest cost savings and efficiencies that we've seen in our new model, and it directly improves the voter's experience. The voter didn't have to wait as long to get their ballot cast. They didn't have to wait in a long line to go, to go through this provisional process. And they're also, as taxpayers, realizing significant savings from the election being more efficient for them. And finally, we've done some improvements in terms of technology. And Matt did, uh, I really enjoyed Matt's presentation because his suggestion uh, about creating sort of a customer service delivery system for voters so that they would know if their ballot got counted is being done, amazingly enough. Um, at least on a, on, on, a, on a very specific form. And that system for us in Denver is Ballot Trace. And if you remember a few slides ago when I talked about the hotline calls and that one in five voters had to call our office to get information in 2008, within that data, the number one call or the number one reason that voters called our office was about the, their status of their mail ballot. So they wanted to know when we were going to send it, whether or not we had sent it, had it come to them yet, did, it, did we receive it on the back end, um, and was it counted? So those were all our top calls in 2008 were about a mail ballot. And we sat down in 2009 and said, given this data, given how many voters contacted our office for this, how do we create a system where we can proactively communicate that information to voters so that they don't have to call us and ask us about it? And so Ballot Trace was born. And ballot Trace is a ballot tracking, reporting, and communication engine. So it allows voters to opt in with their uh, cell phone number or email address, and then we will automatically push the information about the status of their mail ballot to them. So they get a message on when it was mailed, or when it was printed, when it was mailed, when it's with their postal carrier, and then all the way on the back end again. So they'll get messages about when it, once it's been received and verified and sent into the counting room. Our customer service agents also use Ballot Trace to look up information. If there are still voters that call, they can basically look it up for them. And then, by the way, suggest that they become a Ballot Trace subscriber if they do call us about it. 
Um, and then for us on the, on the administration side of things, we also now, because of the system and because of intelligent mail barcoding, we know where all of our ballots are. So when people bring up fraud or say that you know, no one knows where the ballots are, we actually do know and we have data and we have technology now that we can track that. Another example of a, sort of a customer-based solution and system is our new Denver eSign application. And that is a digital petition application. And it was designed with our customers in mind that are candidates, circulators, um, or, or campaigns that are trying to get access to the ballot. And as you all know, the paper petition process is very inefficient, it's very unsecure, it's not very accessible, and candidates and campaigns really have no idea where they are in the process. So they have to collect a lot more signatures than they really need, uh, which creates inefficiencies for election offices. So we basically have digitized the petition process Candidates have a dashboard. They can see exactly where they are in terms of conditional validation of their signatures. And uh, voters have a more secure way of actually signing a petition. So we don't have paper petitions floating around in people's cars with signatures and personal information on them. And the results of that are also pretty staggering. So candidates and campaigns that used e-sign in our May municipal election had a 3% rejection rate. So 97% of their signatures submitted were validated and accepted. Candidates that used the paper process only had a 29%, they had a 29% rejection rate and only a 71% acceptance rate. So a, a huge marketable difference between, between the two in terms of efficiencies for the customer, meaning the candidate or the campaign, and then on the back end for us, it's much more efficient for us to process petitions that are typed out from a, from a, a computer application as opposed to handwriting by the voter. So all of this sort of plays into the future of what this looks like. And we have, we have approached election administration in a customer-centric way, put it at the core of everything that we've done, and we've honestly had tremendous success with different technologies that we've implemented, policy changes that have come about, and operational efficiencies within the office. And so back to the question of what do we do with an idea? Data is the powerful tool that we can use to define it, to develop it, to promote it, and then to measure it on the back end. So really, the, the possibilities are endless for the future of election administration if we're able to focus on the customer and focus on data and how to improve the process for that particular customer. So with that, thank you very much.